This is a work of political and social commentary. The content of this video is not meant for children under the age of 13. Parental discretion is advised. Everyday life is stressful. Managing that stress is important if we want to be able to enjoy life. That's the reason for hobbies. They are an effective technique for relaxing and releasing stress in a healthy way. People have all sorts of hobbies. For me, taking long walks is both exercise and a hobby. I read books. I paint. As a matter of fact, the fireplace background that I'm using for my thumbnails and ending credits is a detail from one of my paintings. I also play games. Some of them, the games that I like to play solo, are computer games. I play board games with my family sometimes, and I also play D&D with my friends because I enjoy the challenge of playing a character and cooperating with others who are also playing characters. I think that it's important to have hobbies because... You sound so triggered! Okay, so there's a few things that we need to deal with here. First, we need to address the concerns raised, and we can only do that by looking at the history. The father of modern epic fantasy is J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings. Professor Tolkien held the Rawlinson and Bosworth Professorship of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford University. Inspired by early Germanic and Celtic mythology, Tolkien wanted to write his own stories in a similar vein. But he didn't want to write those stories until he understood the world in which they would be set. So he created that world, including the histories and cultures of the races in that world. His work was detailed right down to inventing languages and alphabets for those races. This process is now called world building, and it changed our cultural understanding of fantasy forever. His concepts of what is now called epic or high fantasy were adopted generally. Writers followed many of his conventions, fantasy writers especially so. And in 1974, a man named Gary Gygax created Dungeons & Dragons, a fantasy role-playing game which rapidly became a cultural phenomena and core component of nerd culture partially based on Tolkien's writings. Now, Tolkien's works are so detailed that his son, Christopher, spent most of his adult life sorting through his father's extensive papers, gathering and editing the lore upon which The Lord of the Rings was founded, and publishing it in multiple volumes. As more and more of Tolkien's work was published, his work became the basis for an entire discipline of research, Tolkien studies. It's no surprise, then, that among the many critics of his work are those who look for allegories in it. Sauron, the great enemy of Middle-earth, has been called an allegory for more than one 20th century dictator, for example. But another criticism which crops up from time to time is accusations of racism in Tolkien's Legendarium. The Orcs, the Southrons, the Easterlings, and more are all considered allegories for human races by some critics. The fact that C.S. Lewis, a fellow professor and author and one of Tolkien's closest friends, thought that this was utter rubbish is normally ignored by these critics. But don't take my word for it. The Tolkien Gateway has a great article with sources from both sides of the argument. Read for yourself and decide if Tolkien supported racist ideology. Now, bearing in mind that nearly every modern fantasy system is based at least in some part on Tolkien's works, including D&D, and we get to the accusations of racism in those games, especially in the treatment of orcs. We just can't have anything without someone labeling it as problematic, can we? D&D is a role-playing game. That means that the most important part of the game is the gaming system how to handle combat, magic, skills, and other game mechanics. The game also includes an extensive library of creatures and races for gamers to use. Why? Because crafting all of those races and creatures from scratch would take a long time. D&D includes them to speed up world building and gameplay, an important consideration in role-playing games. RPGs involve a lot of world building, just like Tolkien pioneered, so shortcuts to that world building are appreciated. Here's the thing, though. The races and creatures provided by the game aren't comprehensive despite their huge catalog, and they aren't meant to be. D&D doesn't happen in just one world. It happens in hundreds of worlds, if not thousands, 
each of them either crafted by or adopted and adapted by the dungeon master of each gaming group. Any racism involved in those worlds is that which is introduced by the gamers in those groups. There's nothing systematic about it. Orcs, as presented in the basic package of the game, are a large, brutal, animalistic race of creatures with a bent towards violence and destruction. They aren't stupid, and they aren't a villain race either. Players can play orcs and half-orcs. In fact, some of the most enjoyable characters I've played have been orcs and half-orcs. Orcish society in the basic game is pretty harsh and crude. But, and here's a key point, there is no requirement to keep orcish society as brutal, harsh, and crude as it is originally presented in the basic game rules. It's permissible, even encouraged, for gamers to create their own societal rules in their games. It's possible to create a nation of highly cultured and technologically superior orcs who enjoy poetry, sculpture, and gardening. I could create an orc who is a fan of opera, or even an orc bard whose songs charm all who hear them. There are no rules aside from the basic mechanics of the game system, which are binding. Every gaming group I've ever joined has house rules, optional rules which only apply to that gaming group. Role-playing games are a highly developed systematic approach to playing make-believe. So, what's the point of writing about how orcs and gaming systems are supporting systematic racism and oppression? The worlds created are completely imaginary. Any racism in RPGs is brought to the table by the players themselves, and groups usually deal with that racism internally. The encounters can, and in the best games often do, present a moral conundrum as an element of the gameplay. For example, a D&D session that I played in some time ago featured our party being led by a non-player character to a goblin village. The NPC wanted us to retrieve an item for him, and was prepared to lie about the circumstances to get us to do it. We went in prepared to hack and slash our way through the village if necessary, and we even engaged in a protracted combat initially. But when it dawned on the members of the party that the goblins were actually trying to escape us, our characters stopped attacking. The barbarian, who didn't, due to being in a combat range, another game mechanic, was tackled by the others to allow the surviving goblins to escape. The player characters each dealt individually with the emotional fallout of the encounter, addressing the morality of attacking a village unprovoked individually and collectively. And as for the NPC? Well, the party turned on him for provoking the attack by lying. Goblins are, by the way, a similar race to orcs in the D&D Legendarium. Here's an idea. If you don't like how orcs are portrayed in the basic rules, then feel free to change how orcs are portrayed in your world. If that's not enough, feel free to play something else. Stop assuming that orcs are an allegory for anything, because the basic orc rules in D&D were originally designed to provide one of the many challenges for the game. And these rules now include the dynamic that all characters from all races are individuals capable of being rigidly lawful, fluidly chaotic, selflessly good or wickedly evil, or any combination of those value systems. There are creatures whose societies are essentially benevolent, and creatures whose societies are essentially malevolent, but the system allows for the possibility of differences in individuals and groups alike. Stop trying to project a mythology of systemic oppression onto a gaming world. Stop trying to ruin games and hobbies for people who aren't like you. Let people enjoy themselves without worrying about what systems of oppression might exist in their made-up world. And stop and think about why you are so insistent that groups of people who aren't like you and who like different things than you are inherently bad people. Isn't that the very thing that you are accusing those people of doing? 